Hello, everyone. Welcome to World Review with Evo Dalder, a weekly roundup of news from around the world produced by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It's Friday, July 7th. On tap this week, NATO leaders meet in Vilnius, Lithuania next week for their annual summit, the second since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. What will be top of minds of NATO leaders? Ukraine's desire to join NATO? Russian instability after a short-lived but serious mutiny? Or how will this war end? Then we'll take a look at the escalating violence in the West Bank, where Israel deployed armed drones, helicopters, and a thousand troops to the Palestinian refugee camp of Janine. Why this escalation now? What is the impact on Israel itself and on its Arab partners? And how are the Palestinians going to respond? And then finally, another high-level U.S. visit to China with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen landing in Beijing yesterday for four days of talks aimed at building communication links with the Chinese leaders. What can we expect from the visit? Will economic tensions ease? And can both sides find a way out of the trade and sensitive technology impasse that they find themselves? Here to discuss all of these issues are three reporters who cover these stories. Susan Glasser, staff writer of The New Yorker, Bobby Gosh, opinion editor at Bloomberg Opinion, and Adam uh, and J Jamil Anderlini, who is editor-in-chief of Political Europe. Welcome all. Great to have you back. S Susan, let me start with you uh, on uh, the NATO summit, Ukraine, and, uh, and Russia. A lot of things here to talk about, but uh, NATO leaders, when they get together, always say it's the most important summit in a decade or two decades or three decades. Not sure this one uh, uh, is, uh, is any different from that perspective. What do you think the leaders coming together two weeks after a mutiny in, in Russia and with Ukraine trying to get a counteroffensive starting, what do you think they're going to be talking about? Well, thank you so much, Evo. And of course, you know NATO far better uh, than than we do, uh, having uh, seen it from the inside out. But, you know, I, I agree with you that uh, the stakes just could not possibly be higher in terms of this, this NATO meeting uh, right in the midst of uh, a huge Ukrainian, much anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive uh, in uh, the east of the country. This is really a moment to try to understand what the billions and billions of dollars and euros of military assistance pouring into the country, what is that going to be able to produce in terms of a change on the ground? And I, I start with that because I think that that really is the most important backdrop and context, right? This is a military alliance having a meeting at which it's got to look at, you know, the impact that its military assistance is or isn't having in this conflict, the most serious conflict really in Europe since NATO was formed. And, you know, I, I think right now the early reviews are are, uh, it's not producing certainly a best case scenario. Uh, Ukraine has managed to make some inroads, but there hasn't been the kind of punching through of the Russian lines uh, that some had hoped for. The result, by the way, has been that some of those Western trained uh, uh, forces, Ukraine is still holding them in reserve. Uh, and I think you're going to see a little bit of escalating tension over why that is. And of course, from the Ukrainian perspective, what you're hearing is increasing sort of uh, complaints and concerns saying like, listen, if we'd had more weapons on the front end, had we would have been able to make more progress more quickly. And that's the backdrop, I think, that is the most relevant for this summit. Just uh, today in Washington, we're hearing reports that uh, President Biden has once again now agreed to provide a weapons that he refused to do earlier in the conflict, and that would be uh, cluster munitions as a very controversial subject because, of course, those are uh, banned by many of America's European treaty allies, the United States, along with Ukraine and Russia, were not signatories uh, to the ban on cluster munitions. And the rationale for why now, why this change in policy now, is that this is what the Pentagon has available. And this is a sort of an artillery war. And there's a crisis of uh, munitions, enough uh, shells to fire, uh, you know, in the artillery. And so, you know, really the the solution that the Pentagon for months has been sort of pressing uh, in Washington is we need to send, I guess, in the in the Pentagon argument, these are called deep pickums. Uh, and so Biden uh, has now uh, changed course, it looks like. And this is now following a very familiar pattern, right? We've all seen the sort of no, 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 yes, 
then move on to the next fight. No, no, no. Yes. Move on to the next fight. The next frontier, by the way, uh, looks like it will be as a result of that, the attackums, which are the uh, longer range uh, missiles that up until now, the administration was very wary of providing because they said it could be used to strike targets inside Russia and they remain concerned about escalation. But it's a NATO summit. And, you know, so then the question once again goes back to this, you know, kind of long stalemated, but, you know, really painful open sore of a debate about this question of when, if ever, will Ukraine be able to join the alliance? It was promised in a kind of very frustrating and kind of like in unsatisfying way back in 2008, Georgia and NATO uh, were told that they could someday become members of uh, NATO, but not given a clear path toward a session. I'm told that they're still still arguing and hammering out language in uh, whatever communique will ultimately be released next week. But it's not going to be welcome to NATO, Ukraine. Uh, there are strong advocates of that inside the alliance. And then there are people who are firmly opposed, including, by the way, the United States and the Biden administration. So NATO membership remains a non-starter. Probably a clearly outlined pathway to NATO membership uh, is still a non-starter. But they seem to be still struggling and looking for some language and a formulation that would enable Ukraine to be able to say at least that we've taken some steps forward. Uh, for many, of course, strong supporters of Ukraine, that's not going to be enough. They'll say they're going to be in a gray zone without a real security guarantee from the U.S. and its partners. And that's the one other thing I'll spotlight before we move on, which is there's been this very interesting discussion, as you know well, Evo, and maybe you can enlighten this on some of that, but there's been a very interesting discussion in Washington unfolding over the last few weeks and months around a non-NATO type of security guarantee, uh, some people calling it the Israel model. We'll talk about Israel in a, in a different and far you know, more concerning context uh, later in this show, but the Israel model we're talking about here is a long-term memorandum of understanding with the United States on a bilateral basis. There could also be other countries that do the same thing that would basically seek to extend the time frame of U.S. security assistance uh, to Ukraine in order to tell the Russians we're not just going to give up and throw up our hands and walk away without uh, immediate progress on the battlefield. I have my doubts about that. We can talk about that in part because of the Trump factor uh, that hangs over American politics. And we have an election here in 2024. And it's not just Donald Trump, by the way. It's possible that any Republican nominee might not remain committed in the long term uh, to uh, U.S. assistance to Ukraine. But I'll, I'll leave it there. Obviously, a lot to discuss. Yeah, no, uh, Susan, you really put a lot on the table here, uh, uh, the counteroffensive. And, and uh, Jamil, maybe I start with you. Uh, uh, really a, a very important decision that uh, apparently is being announced today by the White House to to provide these cluster munitions, really because there are no other artillery shells, as Susan said. It's the only thing that's available in, in the stockpile. Nobody's producing uh, these munitions at a rate that is necessary for the Ukrainians to fight their war. And, you know, every European country, as far as I know, uh, certainly every European NATO member is a signatory to uh, the cluster munition ban. Uh, and, and so this is a complicated, just as it was complicated inside the White House for that reason, it's a complicated issue for the Europeans. On the one hand, they too want to help the Ukrainians do whatever they can. And yet here are weapons that are formally banned, at least they as national governments have formally banned those weapons. Uh, in, the, in the use of war, uh, a, a complicated factor. Take that or uh, any other of the many uh, excellent points that Susan raised uh, on to the next level. Yeah, that is um, a big topic of discussion over here. Of course, Russia has used uh, similar or the same munitions already in Ukraine, um, uh, including other banned uh, weapons such as, uh, I believe, white phosphorus, things like this, that uh, um, we, we've seen a lot of evidence of of that kind of, um, those kind of tactics from the Russian side. So uh, I, I do think that it's problematic from the perspective of Europe. I'm based here in Brussels. It is uh, it is problematic from a European perspective, but not that problematic. Let's put it that way, that uh, it's not Europe that's providing them. And Europe is, at this point, still... Uh, highly committed to to Ukraine's victory in this uh, in this war with Russia. Um, the other point um, I think that will be 
not it will not be discussed in the formal part of the meeting but it will absolutely be discussed in the back rooms um in vilnius next week uh, and that is uh poor old jens stoltenberg who is yet again being asked to stay on for yet another year and he he's like the saddest dude uh i mean it, I, i'm starting to I'm not quite sure if it's an act. I really want to leave this job. But everyone I talk to say it's not an act. He really wants to leave and they just won't let him. It's a little bit like the Godfather part. Uh, what's, what's that one? That's part three. Um, you know, every time I try to leave, they pull me back in. That's really the position he's in. Um, we have for quite a while at Politico been, been uh, reporting on the different speculations of who might, uh, who might take his place. Um, and... Uh, we, we noticed a British publication, I won't name the one, which one, uh, reported something we reported three months ago and have now reported is not going to happen. But uh, Ursula von der Leyen is the person that the White House would definitely like, the, the current president of the European Commission. Um, I've asked her directly. I've asked all the people around her. I've asked a lot of people in this town and in Brussels. Uh, there is no way Ursula von der Leyen would like to be the head of NATO. Her current job is, from her perspective, far more powerful, important, influential um, secretary general of NATO as someone pointed out to me, has secretary in the job. It's like getting tea for all these countries, including Turkey, <laughs> trying to form consensus amongst, uh, amongst you know, a bunch of people who really don't see eye to eye is far worse of a job than being the president. Let's be clear, it's not a secretary role. She's the president of the European Commission proposing legislation, really the executive branch of Europe. And in her time in that role, she's made it far, far more important. It was predecessors helped to make it more important but she if you think about what she's done it's it's supposed to be a peace compact a peace agreement and they now talk every day about how much ammunition they're going to source and uh and uh buy and uh supply to um to ukraine it's it's just changed immensely under her time become the role that she's in has become vastly vastly more important and nato secretary general would only be at the very best a consolation prize for someone like Ursula von der Leyen. So the right. other names that people are talking about, I'll just very last throw some out there. Um, uh, Sanchez, the current uh, Prime Minister of uh, Spain, if he loses this election, there's a good chance he will. Um, the tallest, most handsome leader in uh, uh, leader of government in Europe. Um, there's a sort of feeling that maybe his Hollywood good looks would get him the job and uh, from the White House perspective. Um, the other people, uh, Kaya Kallis, uh, from, uh, Estonia, there's people who think that she would be a good, um, representative, but there's, there's res reservations around someone from the Eastern, particularly the Baltic countries, because they're so, uh, in the minds of some anti-Russian, you know, pro, pro Ukraine, pro freedom, <laughs> maybe that, uh, that would rule out anyone from there. Anyway, so there's a lot of speculation. It won't be the thing that they discuss in the chamber, but it is definitely the thing that we're all talking about. They're all talking about. That'll be in the in the bars and the cafes. Uh, no, no, no doubt uh, an issue. I mean, at least for the the urgency has uh, has left because he's formally been uh, renominated for for another year. But one of the reasons why people really wanted to solve it this year is because they don't want to, particularly in the United States, don't want to make this part of the European who is going to lead Europe contest because all the European leaders are up in 2024 as well uh, for uh, including Ursula von der Leyen, who would have to be reappointed for a second, what, uh, five year term or uh, a third two and a half year term, I guess, is the more appropriate way to think about it, uh, which would be new and different. Uh, and, and so that's part of the speculation. But it, uh, I, I am sure, uh, Jamil, uh, that within uh, the cafes and bars, not only in Vilnius, but in Brussels, a lot of people are talking about this stuff. So thanks. Uh, thanks for putting that uh, on, uh, on the front burner. Bobby, uh, uh, on this or or on uh, uh, any of the other issues uh, Susan raised, one of which I think will also be very quietly discussed is the worries about Russian escalation, in particular, the uh, 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 the statement a couple of days ago by um, President Zelensky that the Russians had apparently mined the nuclear reactors uh, in Zaporizhia, um, six nuclear reactors, uh, five of which are in cold shutdown, but one of which is in hot shutdown, um, and, and the fear that they might do what they did with the hydroelectric dam a few months ago and blow it up 
uh, and how NATO or the NATO countries ought to respond to that. Yeah, I think I think you know uh, Zelensky has sometimes been accused of crying wolf, but you know, he he warned in October the Russians would blow up that dam, and they eventually did. So I think it behooves us to take him seriously uh, when he makes these uh, when he raises these alarms. Um, uh, and and by exploding that dam, Russia showed that it's it is willing to to go farther than most of us think is an acceptable act of war um, in a in a civilian area, um, and that is the biggest nuclear power, power plant in uh, in Europe, one of the biggest in the world. The catastrophic consequences don't even bear thinking about. Um, but if I can, if I can go back, there, there are two other people that uh, that that I think will be um, will be interesting in in Vilnius. One who really should be there but isn't, and one who a lot of people were hoping wouldn't be there but is. So the the first is the Prime Minister of uh, of Sweden, and the second is the President of uh, Turkey. You know, um, I think when I was last on this this uh, show, the election, Turkish election hadn't happened yet. And a lot of people in the West were hoping that Erdogan would lose and, and that that would by itself open up uh, the path for Sweden to join NATO. That hasn't happened and he doesn't seem likely to change his mind anytime. So, uh, so Sweden stays out. What do you do about that? Um, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the the Israeli um, well, what's the expression? The Israeli package, the Israeli exception model. The model, the Israeli right? model. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, we're talking about an Israeli model for Ukraine. Maybe there is some variation of that for Sweden that needs to be considered because I I, I can't see Erdogan changing his mind. Um, there will be a lot of pressure on him, but you know, now that he has Viktor Orban uh, also in his camp, he'll feel like he doesn't really need to make uh, the concession. Um, and I and we've had these reports over the last several days about uh, uh, the Biden administration being keen to make that F F sixteen deal with Turkey, uh, hoping that that will move the needle with uh, uh, with Erdogan. I'm I'm not so sure that it will. Um, and then one last point, because I realize we've been going on about this for a while, but one last point on Ursula von der Leyen. I, I can't for the life of it, me imagine why the Biden administration wants her in that job. The job she's doing now, she is a far, she's a far greater use to American interests in Europe than she would be as the head of NATO. You know, imagine if 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 she were to make the move, unlikely as that is. Then the Biden administration would have to worry about who takes her job, and 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 you know, would they be as pro uh, or as copacetic with American interests as she is? She's perfect where she is. She does the greatest service to the Biden to American interests where she is. Um, the Biden administration really has no business trying to move her uh, to a job where, frankly, not only would, would she just be a secretary, uh, but almost anybody in the NATO job uh, would. It would be much easier for for the United States to influence than um, than the person who has the EEC job. Yeah, I think that's a, a you know, it's certainly uh, an argument I've been making in Washington. Uh, it, it is it is people in, uh, who are who are focused very much on NATO and are worried about what had happened in the Trump presidency. Can you have a strong enough Secretary General to keep NATO together? I mean, my view is if you have a Trump presidency, that's the last of your worries. Uh, uh, and uh, and having a strong European leader who is, as you said, had, you know, shares many of the views that the U.S. has is uh, it make makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, I'm glad you raised the Erdogan uh, uh, issue and and uh, to to give you a, a plug, Bobby. When you were on talking before the election, you did warn that uh, you thought it was likely that Erdogan might win. Um, and uh, that was not the mood, uh, uh, let me say, in, in most of the reporting at the time. You'd just come back from Turkey uh, and had sensed the, the mood within the country. Uh, and uh, so we always take you seriously, but uh, just to, d d we uh, just another another reason to listen when when Bobby talks about Turkey and, and many other uh, reasons. Let me let me uh, jump on, on and, and continue, Bobby, on on uh, on the events in in the West Bank and just in the last uh, uh, week or so. Really, we've seen a steady escalation uh, of conflict between Israelis and uh, this time West Bank uh, 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 Palestinians, not not so much Gaza. 
Um, and of course, a major, major military operation in Janine for the first time in, in 20 years. You reported from Janine 20 years ago. Uh, uh, how do, how should we see what is happening? Uh, what, what's the aim here? What's the goal here? And, and, and where does this end? Uh, is there any hope that it ends without further escalation? Uh, or is that, uh, just a, a, a faint hearted uh, attempt to hope that sanity prevails? Uh, I'm afraid not. I, I think this is the new normal now. Uh, we're used to seeing this sort of military operation uh, in Gaza. West Bank has been, relative to Gaza anyway, uh, more stable and quiet uh, for 20 years since I was at the first Battle of Janine. But I think that's that silent, that quiet has been shattered now. Uh, what's been happening in the past 20 years is that um, several different things have been happening simultaneously. The, the Palestinian Authority has uh, been weakening and, and getting more corrupt and, and less efficient. The Israeli uh, settlement settlers have been encroaching more and more into the West Bank with um, not even tacit, fairly quite open encouragement and support from uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, even more uh, sort of uh, encouragement from the radical right-wing parties that now make up his governing coalition um and the and the the arab states which uh previously could be relied upon to try and put some pressure on on israel well they've they've thrown their hands up they're making separate deals with israel they're not really particularly uh, they don't seem particularly anxious about uh, the the palestinian cause and finally and this is crucial in that is iran in the last five or six years has has accelerated its effort, taking advantage of the vacuum created by all these other factors, accelerated its influence in the West Bank uh, with Islamic Jihad, which is all powerful there. And so it, it has been building up Islamic Jihad just as it has done Hamas over the past two decades. Um, and Israel now effectively faces um, uh, terrorist groups uh, backed by Iran from two different fronts. And, and this is quite a lot to do with the policies that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has followed himself. Um, he has uh, to take a, a sizable share of the blame for this, um, but it does suit his uh, interests in the very narrowest sense, because while he has this big political uh, challenge that he's facing in governing Israel, it's useful to have a distraction like the attack on Janine, uh, cynical as that might sound. Um, as important as the as the military operation in Janine, as you say, that hasn't happened in 20 years. Um, last week, two rockets were fired from Janine. Rockets are usually fired from, from Gaza. First time uh, rockets, I think in, in 18 years is what, what, one report I saw, that rockets were fired from Janine. And that, that bodes very, very badly for Israel. If, if more rockets get into the hands of Islamic Jihad in Janine, then you, you'll you have that, that Iron Dome that the Israelis have will be tested like it's never been tested before. I can't see this getting better anytime soon, I'm afraid. Uh, not a uh, not an optimistic outlook, which uh, strikes me as as realistic. And, and and Susan, how does this play into the American political scene? Uh, in, in in particular, I wonder. Uh, you know, there there used to be for a very long time a singular American view when it came to uh, this conflict, uh, and it, it strikes me that the issue is becoming increasingly hard to uh, for for. Democrats in particular, younger people, I think more in generally, who didn't grow up in the same way with the 67 war and the 73 war as, as galvanizing moments for, for support of Israel, um, uh, to, uh, but, but really are, have been seeing what has happened in the last uh, 20 plus years. They don't remember Oslo, uh, cause they weren't around, uh, at that time. Uh, how, how does, how does this change, uh, or, or, or accelerate? Uh, an internal political division in the United States. Yeah, I, I do think, Evo, that this is a, a something that will be seen increasingly through a partisan lens here in the U.S. Uh, that has been the the long term story over the last couple decades. I totally agree with you know Bobby sort of showcasing you know both inside Israel and the West Bank. What you've seen are definitely uh, essentially the the fraying of uh, what. Uh, authority existed within the Palestinian Authority. So this is a story about, uh, you know, who's in control 
uh, of the West Bank and what, uh, you know, are the security and governance arrangements. It's definitely also a story about Netanyahu and his at a time when he has an enormous number of domestic political challenges. Historically, security and national security has been uh, a strong suit for him with Israelis, even those who don't much like him politically, even those who violently disagree with his uh, policies inside the country and his sort of attack on democratic institutions. Many of them have been able to, willing to put up with uh, Netanyahu because they saw him as a strong uh, force for national security. Obviously, uh, this kind of distraction may reinforce those credentials of Netanyahu. But at the same time, they also underscore that there are new security threats uh, uh, that may come as a result of his his hardline rule and the lack of a viable the lack of a viable Palestinian governing partner. Right, uh, that's always been the kind of uh, uh, you know is there any actual man behind the curtain? <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, for years, that's been the question is, you know, the sustainability and how long is is Abu Mazen really uh, going to be around? It reminds me in many ways of the the Cuba debate. Remember, you know, for years it was like, OK, well, this is the year that Fidel Castro is going to go and it's all going to fall apart. I mean, there's been a sort of a similar thing at the same time you've had uh, because of the Abraham Accords, you've had individual, you know, kind of Gulf states in particular just sort of saying like, yeah, this is no longer going to be our thing. There's also a new generation of leaders in the Gulf. And so all of that comes back here into the U.S. Uh, as we head into a political year, support for Israel has become increasingly important inside the Republican primaries and increasingly less important uh, for Democratic voters. And uh, so there's been much less pressure, I would say, actually on Biden. The Biden administration has been extremely disengaged from the region overall and from uh, Israel specifically uh, relative uh, to the level of intensive intensive debate discussion and you know back and forth that would have occurred in previous eras you know that well yourself uh, having been in government uh it's kind of amazing uh you know in the past we'd have had to have presidential statements about something like this uh it, you know israeli thing i i'd like to go back and look at the playbook for what kind of commentary you saw from george w bush uh about israel the last time this happened and I mean, frankly, you're not seeing any of it. So I think that speaks to where we are in the politics of uh, the Middle East when it comes to Washington and the U.S. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's very apt. I mean, even in the Obama administration, this was this would have been a central thing. Of, uh, 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 you know, the there was a big war with Gaza during the transition between by, uh, Obama and Bush, which was was sort of took the transition uh, uh, as a as a focal point, at least for the foreign policy people at the time. So it it is it is different. And and, and Jamil, uh, uh, the relationship between Europe and and uh, and Israel has always has always been. Uh, complicated. Uh, I assume that this makes it more complicated. And also, uh, there's a new factor, at least perhaps a new factor, which is which is your old stomping ground in in, in China with Abu Mazen uh, visiting Xi Jinping. What is it, three four weeks ago? Uh, and the Chinese saying that they will be happy to come in and and uh, and to help uh, the parties negotiate a two state solution. To which I would say, and I imagine every other person who's ever looked at this, good luck. Uh, but what's uh, how do you see both what, what's happening in Europe and how do the Chinese look at this? Yeah, so um, on the Europe thing, as you say, I mean, it is so complicated here. You have uh, members of the European Parliament who uh, can't even visit Israel because they're seen as uh, to pro-Palestinian, to anti-Israeli. Uh, you have Germany, which obviously has its history and its own special uh, approach to, um, you know, to Israel, to Palestine. Um, you have general sympathy, I would say, in the European Union to the existence of, of Palestine, um, but it is so complicated. It's just given the history of Europe, um, the horrible history of World War II and the Holocaust. And, you know, it just, it just gets, um, but I would actually, um, and I've only been in Europe uh, going on two years, um, but I would say that what's struck me is how, um, how less on the agenda it is than, than in my, uh, my understanding of in the past. I mean, you have huge, uh, obviously Muslim and uh, 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 Arab uh descended populations 
in France, in Germany, and across across uh, Europe. Um, and even amongst some of those communities, it doesn't seem to be as uh, big an issue as it has in the past. We've obviously just seen huge riots across France and um, a person of a 17 year old of North African descent was killed and this led to huge riots, but there were not in the past, you might have seen more Palestinian flags, for example, and some of that uh, unrest uh, saw more overtly political, politicized unrest. And um, given what was happening at the same time, it was somewhat surprising to commentators that I've been talking to and listening to here that uh, these two things didn't sort of combine into an even more combustible situation. So, I, I mean, from a layperson and a more maybe economic perspective, the reduced importance of uh, Middle Eastern energy supplies um, to the rest of the world is is potentially part of this. Uh, why the attention's not on um, not on the Middle East more broadly? Um, that's partly one of it. One potential reason, um, of course, for China. You mentioned China. Uh, Middle Eastern energy supplies are absolutely crucial to the ongoing survival of the the Chinese economy. At least for now, they get a lot more from Russia these days, but. Um, for the Chinese economy, it's still heavily, heavily, heavily reliant on Saudi and uh, Middle Eastern energy. I, when I was based in Beijing, what I would hear from uh, Middle East experts, um, Chinese Middle East experts, academic Middle East experts are always, always failed American experts. It's very interesting. Like uh, they go into academia, they become America experts. If they don't make it there, they have to choose somewhere else. And um, some of them will go into the Middle East expert, uh, but they're still American experts um, or want to be. Um, but it's very interesting. They would say, look, we're best friends with Israel and Palestine. Who else can, can, uh, can say that? We're best friends with Saudi and Iran. Who else can say that? Um, obviously, we saw that very sort of uh, striking image of China negotiating a Saudi Iran Iran detente um, a, a couple of months ago. It's it's you know kind of astonishing. Um, I agree with you. Good luck with that. Uh, let's see. You know, uh, uh, Middle East peace deal in Israel Palestine brokered in Beijing. I, I personally don't think we're going to see it, but. That's what uh, the propaganda coming out of Beijing is is sort of talking about. And uh, as you say, you know, uh, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, uh, I, I, I take away really from the conversation just uh, up to this point uh, on this issue that something that I think would have been bigger in all in, in the United States, in, uh, in Europe and other places including in in in, uh, in the Arab world uh is becoming less and less important it shows that the centrality of the Israel Palestine conflict of Palestinians and Israelis in regional and, and certainly in global affairs is is less than it used to be uh and it may be economic issues it may be uh, other issues but 2002 uh this would have been a top story on CNN uh, uh, on MSNBC, or, uh, if it existed, and Fox and everything else, and it and it isn't, frankly. Um, and so there's something changing that is uh, that is in, in in some ways pretty fundamental. Although uh, it, it's yeah. important to say, Evo, that the reason is that we're dealing with the largest land war, you know, in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and, 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 oh, but in 2002, yeah. Afghanistan was still very much uh, a, big, a big story. Um, that, so, you know, that, that was happening in the backdrop. And the first battle of Janin still got a lot of attention. The Palestinians, I think the, what I take away from this is that the Palestinians are now completely and utterly alone. They're caught between several rocks and several hard places. A part of the reason why the Europeans and the Bush and the Biden administration uh, are no longer paying that much in, uh, attention, part of the reason, is that the Abraham Accords gives us all an out, right? The, the Arabs are talking to the Israelis. They have formal relations. Now it's up to them. It's nothing to do with us. That's the that's the view, I think, that, that is developing. That Let the UAE worry about uh, how Israel is treating uh, the, um, the Palestinians. That's no longer something that the West needs to bother about. And the Palestinians, if it hasn't come home to them yet, it must now do that they're completely by themselves. And yeah, Iran... No, only game in town. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I think that's a, that's a, a, exactly, exactly right, and at least to the kind of despair that we see individual stories of thirteen-year-olds writing their, 
their uh, their wills for their parents uh, because they yeah. want to be martyrs. Um, uh, it, it, a truly sad and, and heartbroken kinds of reporting that we've seen. Uh, Jamil, I think one of the other reasons uh, that perhaps the issue is not ringing is, of course, the dominance now of the China US competition uh that that sort of is in is a new factor uh certainly compared to 2002 uh in uh, in how we are looking at the world just in, in, on top of the largest land war uh, as Susan rightly says uh in, in Europe um secretary uh Yellen is in is in Beijing as we speak um uh, she gave a very important i think speech uh, in April about the relationship between the United States and China in an economic uh, uh, framework, followed by a speech by, by Jake Sullivan that tried to merge our domestic and, econo and foreign economic policy. Uh, uh, the, the general sense is that uh, Yellen will get a better reception than Tony Blinken because she is more inclined to be to see the world in ways that Chinese uh, like. Is that, one, a correct assumption? Uh, and, and two, um, uh, take us into into Chinese thinking, given the economic, you know, difficulty that China has. How are they going to look at the relationship that with the U.S. economically that Yellen might be able to uh, uh, to help them uh, uh, address? Yeah, I, I'd say uh, it sounds weird, but I'm probably still slightly more familiar with uh, the thinking in Zhongnanhai than I am in uh, in Washington D.C. Um, but uh, it does strike me that uh, Janet Yellen, based on her background and her public statements, is certainly uh, appears more uh, sympathetic to um, engagement, the, the sort of somewhat um, discredited uh, perspective of the, the need for more for engagement with China. Um, uh, if you read Politico's brilliant reporting out of Washington, D.C., uh, you will know that there are disagreements within the Biden administration over how exactly to to deal with China. And in my conversations when I was last in D.C. a little while ago, um, certainly that, that was confirmed. Um, uh, and the Communist Party of China is extremely adept at playing on differences amongst its adversaries. And when uh, when presenting itself to the world, making it appear at least that there are no uh, differences of opinion whatsoever within the Communist Party itself. Of course, that's not quite true. But um, today we have a, a Chinese Communist Party that is as uh, unified in its praise of the cult of personality of uh, Emperor Xi Jinping than it than at any time since uh, you know the, the early 1970s under Mao Zedong. Um, and certainly the whole Communist Party machine is working on maybe not strategy, but definitely tactics. And they're very, very good at this. They're extremely good at splitting the European Union and then splitting governments within European countries. And they're very, very good at doing it with the United States. And so um, if you look at the smiles and the flowers and the welcome for Janet Yellen, it's completely different um from the the rather stiff cold reception that uh Anthony Blinken received and that's in, of course entirely intentional I used to experience it myself as a journalist my editors um or, or colleagues senior columnists coming from London would get treated fabulously well and just shown the most amazing time and I would be and then there would be complaints directly to them about my behavior and like, oh, look, you know, he just doesn't understand China. Uh, you know, he's just, uh, he hates China or something like that. You know, it's it's very clever. They do it with news organizations. They do it with, you know, it's tactical, not strategic, really, because, you know, ultimately, I think it works in the, uh, in the other direction. And if you look at what Janice, Janet Yellen said when she met with the American Chamber of Commerce, the first thing that came out of her mouth is, I'm with you. Uh, we've got to fight this, uh, you know, evil Chinese uh, Communist Party um, economic uh, strangulation of our businesses. And really, she's obviously knows that they're trying to play her off against other members of the administration. And so she is talking tough, even though she's the one who's most sympathetic. So it, in that sense, highly tactical not very smart strategically in my opinion and 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 bobby i mean if that's the the case uh uh they have a strategic problem the chinese uh which is that uh the united states approach to 
uh, at least increasingly, the U.S. and the European and some Asian allies approach is pretty strategic. Uh, we saw the Dutch uh, government uh, putting new export controls on semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Uh, we saw the Japanese doing the same. We have, of course, the semiconductor uh, uh, executive order by the United States. Um, and we see uh, we we see this deteriorate this this the increasing uh, geopolitical drive to how we think about the economic relationship that is interfering. Uh, this is no longer the kind of uh, economic relationship that uh, people uh, expected to have between the Chinese and 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 so how it's just it, it's fundament it's it's fundamentally changed. And how does Yellen sort of try to deal with that? I don't think I don't think realistically she can. I, I think this is part, you know, Yellen's going there and Blinken uh, before her. This is part of the effort by the Biden administration to show the world that look, we're doing our best. We're trying to talk to the Chinese. We're sending senior people out there. Uh, we're not we're not being um, unreasonable. Um, but there was a report, I think, maybe maybe even on, uh, uh, on Politico uh, last week that Biden is lining up a new set of uh, restrictions on American investment into into China. Uh, so you know, if any goodwill uh, that uh, that Yellen can generate in uh, in Beijing uh, will immediately vanish when those new um, when Biden makes that announcement. So th th this is this is theater. Uh, it's important to have it, uh, but I, I don't expect uh, Janet Yellen to be able to move the needle one bit. Susan, uh, the criticism on the right uh, and the Republican right, Mike Gallagher, the uh, co-chair of the uh, what is it, the House uh, Select Committee on 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 China, uh, said that this is kowtowing uh, to uh, uh, to the Chinese by by even talking to them. This uh, this idea that talking uh, is a form of weakness. Uh, how does this pay politically? If there's one thing that Republican candidates agree on, is they don't like China. Uh, although you never know with Donald Trump, uh, uh, but they have a, a strong, a strong anti-Chinese view. Uh, how does this play politically in, in the U.S.? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think that's right that in terms of the political theater, I mean, I'm just struck by the, the emptiness of this con the conversation, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, will a visit change anything? Good guess is no, right? Uh, you know, right now you're looking at a situation where there's an increasing gap between the overheated and and yet very robust uh, China, China, China discussion in the uh, emerging kind of Republican presidential primaries versus uh, any actual kind of movement in terms of what is the policy, where is it evolving, what is even the policy of these Republican candidates? As you said, to be anti-China is not actually a policy. I mean, it's 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 just a sort of a positioning, and uh, I'm struck by that. You know, anytime anyone opens their mouth, you know, you're going to hear from Nikki Haley that they're <laughs> accommodating to the Chinese. But um, you know, again, what what is an actual emerging it, genuine difference of opinion? Both political parties in Washington in recent years have become increasingly kind of hawkish in their rhetoric toward China. What you've seen uh, in the recent months is the Biden administration kind of pull back a bit in terms of they seem to be kind of hurtling towards an actual confrontation that they weren't prepared to to carry through. But it's very noticeable uh, that that the Biden administration has not rolled back some of the protectionist policies of the Trump administration. Clearly, uh, they feel that that's too politically risky to do uh, and, and, and have a very different vision of a long term, not just strategic competition with China, but but actually adversarial relationship. And that's the difference I think that you see in, in this administration versus its predecessors. You also, you know, increasingly here, uh, we're not going to give up on our pivot to Asia this time. We know that we're dealing with this problems uh, in Europe and with Russia. We know that we're dealing with challenges elsewhere in the world. But this time, we have to get serious about a longer term thing. But I, look, I have a very firm view of this, which is that the biggest geopolitical crisis in the world is the United States' own internal political crisis. And uh, the question of what kind of strategic competition we're able to have with China revolves around the strength of our own 
economy to it to a large degree it revolves around the question of whether we can have a foreign policy that survives more than four years before the voters uh throw the administration out and come up with a very radical course correction we don't know the answer to that question until next year so it seems to me that having kind of long-term discussions about russia and china as inevitably foreign policy uh wonks like us want to do it's stuck in the fact that we don't know what 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 our foreign policy is going to look like a year from now. Yeah, that's true for a, a lot of things, Susan, for sure. Uh, um, uh, but 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 very true. I mean, uh, Jamil, uh, just final word to you. Uh, um, the other thing that happens is that uh, uh, the foreign minister of the European Commission, uh, Josep Borrell, was supposed to go to China, and uh, his his. Uh, his visit got canceled. Uh, I mean, he got canceled. Yeah. I guess he got canceled. Uh, he got canceled. Uh, uh, how, He's quite how capable of canceling himself. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> so the the high representative of the uh, European External Action Service, uh, Joseph Borrell, is an old Spanish uh, socialist, um, a very interesting fellow who um, tends to make gaffes uh, on a, a Biden on steroids type uh, type <laughs> level. Um, and it's uh he he's sort of astonishing for he opens his mouth and he makes some terrible mistake and everyone criticizes him for a while and uh he doubles down and anyway he was supposed to go to china um what i heard was uh it was canceled just a, a day or two ago by the chinese side what i heard was the excuse from what from china was the uh the the chinese foreign minister Qin Gang was going to be not well next week. <laughs> so um, uh, I thought that was quite uh, sort of in ingenious. They can see the future and they can see he's got a, he's going to be a bit sick next week. So, uh, or some sort of medical procedure, something like that. So it was a, it was a obvious, um, not very true um, excuse that was meant to humiliate and to, uh, and probably, you know, put Europe in its place and explain, um, you know, and this is, by the way, this is the, Second time his uh, Burrell's trip has been uh, delayed. The first time um, was right around the time of the Macron visit, just after that, um, and he mysteriously and suddenly got COVID and couldn't go to China. And this talk of the town here was that uh, someone was sent to bring a false positive and say, "Look, oh no, he can't go because he's got because they were so worried about what he was going to give away and say uh, on that trip." So, but this time it was the Chinese side that cancelled it. Uh, who knows? Who knows what's going on there? But uh, doesn't bode well for uh, Europe's attempt to kowtow to to China. Mysteries and mysteries all around. Uh, we will uh, be watching it. I hope that no one gets sick next week. Uh, okay. If you anticipate that, uh, take some uh, vitamin C. Uh, in the meantime, a really uh, fantastic conversation. Uh, um, Bobby Gosh, uh, uh, Jamil uh, Anderlini, Susan Glasser, thanks so much uh, for joining us this week. And thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another edition of World Review. Until then, have a great weekend.